So we're here to solve this Yagelin puzzle by Prasanna Sashadri. It was our first puzzle on the Grandmaster Puzzle site this year with the 2020 and the 2021 theme. You can see another 2021 on the diagonal. It's a really elegant puzzle, maybe a little harder than a normal Monday, but it was also the first time we were using these PenPyta tools, which are highly functional. We've got lots of ways you can draw on the grid with them, but not always highly intuitive. And so we wanted to take the advantage of having solving videos this year that would both use the tools to try to give you some tips and tricks but also even teach you a little bit of some of the ways to interact with uh, these, uh, these solving uh, options for digital solving. When uh, any solver would have clicked from the side in this tool, it will load uh, for the style in a composite Yagellon by default and how we are setting it up. And in that default setting, a single click in any box, even a clue box, will make it into a black cell. Don't do this. Uh, the auto edit won't, uh, the auto solve won't work if you have black and clues. But uh, you can also hold down the mouse button and drag and in doing so draw loop sections and so there's a way to just interact with without ever having to touch this toolbox using the composite setting but i find solvers sometimes want to put in different uh markings and shading or not shading one of the things in my default uh Yagellon notations actually to mark edges like this where i know that a box is in one of the two cells the loop doesn't cross that edge and so what I'm going to do at the start here of this video is a thing that I, I will describe here, maybe not describe all the time, is to actually come through this tab menu and make sure I've got my preferred notations uh, available. So surface is a way to shade in squares, and so I will want to shade in squares here. I want to draw lines between squares because I'm drawing a loop. And I really like doing the edge between boxes marking with an X. And so if I go through that and mark those three options, effectively a tab gives me the uh, draw helpers with X's. Uh, if I come back over, I can click in squares. The default of a dark gray option actually lets you do a second click to a, a, a green. And so I'm going to use dark gray and green as my two colors as I'm talking through this video. And when I'm in lines, if I click and drag, I click and drag and form the line. And if I uh, do not uh, do anything else, uh, that will be really good. So we're set to go. We can start our timers, and we'll start by drawing some of the easy lines in this puzzle. The two corners have these very long channels that have lots of cells with exactly two entrances and exits. Uh, we couldn't put a shaded box in any one of them because we'd end up isolating places where the loop would need to go around them. Um, in doing so, we actually fulfill a few of these clues straight away. I'm going to see some clues like this zero up where I'm just going to mark these cells in green. These are not part of the loop. Uh, sorry, these are not able to be shaded. They must be part of the loop. I've got two down as a remaining clue that's going to need to have two cells put uh, in shading, and they can't be adjacent to each other. So when I've got three cells left and two cells to shade, it's going to be a pattern like this. The loop is going to have to bend up, and the loop will always corner efficiently around shaded cells. And so steps like this are very common in Yagellon puzzles, and I'm going to go through them pretty quickly in this video because uh, once you're used to them, uh, you're going to be able to see them as fast as I am, at least to draw the, the sections of loop in after you put a step into the grid. I'm going to come down to this clue that's one left, and if you've not solved Yashin before, you may not recognize sort of how having a box in one of these two cells is a pretty quick solution. It turns out right off the corner of the grid, you can't shade in a cell. You will effectively made a cell like this to have just one end. The loop can't come into it without isolating uh, that end with nowhere else to go. Another cell that actually has a problem is a cell right to the uh, right of it. You're actually also making this into a three-way cell, and we're going to see later in this puzzle where an implied shading that leads to a three-way cell is the real issue. So the thing that you can do is when you've got a cell that you know you're never shading off a corner, and I can even just mark these in, it's not too useful, um, is that you can take a clue like this one to the left and pretty quickly recognize that it's going to mark in the cell that we just put in and get us a place to start using uh, that information pretty effectively. So let's still go around the grid uh, and figure out some other cells we can be marking. Um, I'm going to put in all the information I can for the clues I have. This two to the left has shaded cells in the places uh, either the left or right of each of these X's. Um, the two up top actually would similarly at this time have uh, shadings in these uh, sections. There's a harder deduction in Yagellon puzzles where they have to have more cells when they're one off of an edge. Uh, one row off an edge where they've got to be two apart, not just one apart. But for now, for a Monday puzzle, we're not going to use that uh, deduction directly, but we will mark these in. 
And the key deduction I had for the whole puzzle was right here. I would actually come to a different color. Um, the deduction comes from the fact that putting a, a cell in, in a shaded section quickly puts uh, pieces just around it to require the loop to go by them. And if it weren't for the fact that this cell, uh, I'll mark this in blue, already had a loop end coming into it, it'd be okay to have the loop edge coming to the top and to the left of the shaded cell. But what we've effectively done by shading the cell in red is made a three-way cell in blue that has nothing more we can do to it to get rid of any edges around it. It's got three edges right now that could be taken in. The left is already being used and the bottom and right are places an edge could go, but really one and not both of those uh, edges are where the loop will move out to. And so what that functionally means is that the cell in red can't be red, uh, it, it, it can't be shaded. We have to be shading the other option. And so once this cell gets marked, uh, this left cell, the rest of the puzzle is uh, sort of quickly gonna, gonna resolve out, at least for some of the immediate next steps. The loop ends will quickly corner around this box. Uh, we now have this, this cell in green that's gotta be part of the loop and it's got two edges to it. So it's gotta come in and out from that cell. The cell now below also has two edges uh, left to use, and so the loop's gonna quickly go through those. On the other side of the shaded box is another corner where the loop's gonna be put in. The loop's gonna dodge uh, closing too soon. So these cells all get marked in. We get to a, 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 this stage of the puzzle. And we now, because of our notation, when we mark and consider the remaining clues, particularly this one left with this two right, we're gonna have a situation where we've got two X's that are now in a two by two square, and going to naturally force a checkerboard pattern and how they get colored, one of these two options to work. And it should be pretty clear that this option is no good. It actually isolates a single white cell here and also makes another cell right above it where the loop comes in and can't do anything more around it. And so uh, a quick way that our notation helps us here is we use the two adjoining clues in rows two and row three to mark uh, those black squares. We get to where a loop section has en entered a cell that has an X, and so the loop is gonna have to go around it like so. The box comes to the other side. Similarly, on this side, the loop is gonna corner near these shaded cells. Once it touches this cell here, it's gonna force the shaded cell to be the other option for that space, sort of get quick progress like so. We've got two clues left in gray that we haven't looked at, so I'm going to come back to those and mark uh, what we know about them. In this case, we've got one shaded cell already in the column and one more to place, which has to be in one of these two cells, so marking that X effectively marks the information for that clue. And this two up in the eighth column has four cells left that a box can go in, but only one box in these two cells, only one box in those two cells. And now there are ways that you should be able to quickly recognize why one of the two options is bad in both situations. In this case, in the top, this is probably one that a beginner will be able to see more quickly than the other. Um, putting this in leaves behind a single cell that the loop would have to enter but can't exit, so that's no good. We're going to need to have the top one shaded. The bottom option, why it, it can't be the top cell may be harder, but with this notation, hopefully it's useful that you can see if the loop came into the cell, uh, you end up forcing the shading of these cells around it. Basically, the X's move out, and so you've, you've caused an issue there. And so the real thing that happens is that, uh, let me come back one more step, we have to shade in the cell. Like, you have, you have an option when you have two X's that are nearby each other. They're either two separate squares or the same square. And often when those clues in your notation come in that way, you should consider, can two cells uh, both be shaded, or is only one cell shaded the right? option. In this case, it's pretty clear that uh, one cell being shaded is the only way to go. So we put uh, the loop around that shaded cell. We get to a stage like this. This X can't be crossed by the loop, so for this to work, the loop's got to continue up and shade the cell. Um, the lines, these two ends, if they connected, would form a single distinct loop from this other loop in the top, so we don't want to do that. So we come over like this. We've got a uh, uh, rest of the grid that's all white cells. We really can't shade any of these cells in black because we'll isolate pieces of the grid. So the effective loop is the one that goes through all of them. You'll see we've reached this, the correct solution, at least uh, uh, as, as the software shows. But if we step back from the grid, we see we've got one loop and we've got all the cells marked in dark gray that are boxes. And that's a successful solve and successful start to the year with this uh, Yatlin puzzle from Persona. So I hope you learned a little bit about uh, the PenPy Edit interface and also some tips and tricks on Yagilin notation through this video. 
We'll have more videos through the week uh, trying to use the PenFIDA tools and also a few on paper just because that's still a, a way for me to have my free notation where I want to see it. So please watch the rest of the videos for the week and we'll see you again soon.